Welcome everyone. Folks are joining, so we'll wait just a couple of minutes before we kick things off. Welcome everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started this afternoon. Um, glad that you are here and able to join us today as we um, roll into our second uh, webinar of this 10 webinar series um, where we will start to talk a little bit um, about unfinished learning in mathematics. So um, glad that you're here. Um, for those of you that weren't able to join us last week, I, I did just kind of want to look back and uh, just reference uh, last Thursday's webinar, which uh, our, our goal was to link unfinished learning and instructional equity and continue to elevate the um, importance of um, equity in our work and, and during this time. Uh, we had an awesome keynote from Lacey Robinson, the CEO and president of Unbound Ed. I got a lot of great feedback um, from folks around Lacey's message and there were just some really great um, visuals and, and ideas as we think about supporting not only summer learning but looking towards the fall. I do want to mention that the webinar from last week and the slides are posted and archived at the link that you see in the chat box. So as you're on that specific page, if you hover over the first tile, you will see um, the link to those as well. And we are still getting Lacey slides, so we'll have those soon and uh, we'll get those posted as well. I wanted to mention, um, as uh, I didn't really call this out last week, but you're welcome to continue the conversation um, uh, with us via Twitter. Uh, you can see my Twitter handle as well as a Twitter handle for School Kit Group. And, uh, if you're tweeting today, um, be sure to use the hashtag Launch Nebraska. Just a quick reminder before I kick it over to um, School Kit is that um, our goal in this uh, professional learning series is uh, really to build out on the continuity of learning plans and um, our hopes is that we provide information and resources that um, school districts and school systems can use um, as they're planning and continuing to plan summer learning, but also making plans towards the fall. Um, and so that really is kind of how we're focusing things, um, thinking a little bit about summer learning and then, uh, but also previewing uh, things that we might want to be thinking about as we look towards the fall. Um, excited uh, this week to um, talk more about mathematics. And so um, I'm going to kick it over to Brian uh, with our partner School Kit as we uh, dive deeper into unfinished learning in mathematics. So over to you, Brian. All right, thanks, Corey. <clears throat> and as you can all see, Corey and I both got the memo about the uh, blue shirt and shaved head. So we've, we've got the uniform down. Um, my name is Brian Ricker, and I am currently the director of math here at School Kit. I joined the organization after a career in teaching, coaching, leading and district support, uh, both in small and large urban public school districts. I'm based here in Denver, Colorado currently, and I love to get outdoors, go camping, hiking, play sports, and really just enjoy everything the Rockies and the Great Plains have to offer. Uh, and I do that most often with my, my favorite adventure pal, my dog, Bentley, that you can see there. So enough about me, let's talk about our session for today. We'll go through just a couple of norms so that we can make sure that we uh, are all on the same page about how we can engage with today's learning. First, if you have any questions, whether that's technology questions, issues, or logistics, feel free to drop those into the Q&A feature. Uh, we have some colleagues from SchoolKit that are going through those and we'll be able to support you with that as they come up. Additionally, we'll be looking at some materials throughout today's session. So we recommend that you go to the view options in your Zoom menu and exit full screen so you can access the links in your web browser 
while being able to see the screen as well on Zoom. Additionally, as Corey mentioned, uh, recorded sessions and this PowerPoint deck will be available on the Launch Nebraska website. So you can go there to be able to access any of the materials we talked through today, as well as this webinar. One other feature that we're going to use throughout today's webinar is the chat function. Um, I'll prompt you when we're looking for whole group share outs and you'll be chatting all panelists. Um, so panelists will be able to see it and we'll be reading these out uh, as we go through today's session to share with you some of the things that are coming through. So let's look at what we're going to focus on today. Our session focus is really around exploring evidence-based practices to address unfinished learning in mathematics. We will very briefly talk about Zern Math today, but on Thursday, we're gonna dive more in depth into the summer learning tool that Zern Math has created to address unfinished learning in mathematics. So as I said, we'll see a little bit of that today. But the majority of that is gonna come on Thursday. As we get started, Let's take a moment to look at this powerful chart that showcases unfinished learning predicted as a result of the early closures from a recent NWEA research study. To help orient you to it, the solid lines here show typical growth and summer slide that students experience, and the dotted line shows the impact on students as a result of early school building closures. Take just a moment to review the data and see what's there. So as you're looking at this, you're likely seeing that we're going to experience or we're predicted to experience greater and more significant unfinished learning as a result of early school closures than we typically see in a year. Through this study in ELA, we're predicting an unfinished learning of around 30% of the year. Here in math, however, it's predicted that we're going to experience and see unfinished learning of at least 50% for students, with some grades predicting students to be nearly a full year behind what we would observe in normal conditions. The facts of this are really clear. This work is important and absolutely necessary for us to engage in. As we engage in this work, there are three guiding principles that I wanna highlight to keep in mind throughout the work. First, we know that school closures created a lot of change and new situations. As we continue and as we think about fall reentry, we need to put people first. Teachers and students may be returning in the fall with trauma and anxiety. And we need to lead from a place of compassion, make sure that we have systems and structures in place to support them in that return. Our second principle is around integrating math content, not remediating. When we look back at last year's content, we don't just want to take what wasn't taught and drop it into the beginning of the year to move forward. We also don't want to just speed it up so we can get through it more quickly and then get through this next year's content more quickly. Instead, we want to intentionally integrate last year's content, unfinished learning, into this year's content. Our third principle is to keep it simple and focused. This is not the time to overcomplicate anything. And it also doesn't mean that we need to change everything. What we ask of teachers must be simple and concrete. One key addition to this principle is around staying the course with implementing high quality curriculum or high quality instructional materials. They contain aligned content back to the standards that can be the guide for the work that we do this next year. Additionally, we're going to talk about some action planning, and there are three key phases to action planning. First, setting the stage, doing the groundwork so that we can go into stage two, which is planning. And last, implementation. On today's webinar, we're going to focus really specifically on this planning phase, the work that teachers and leaders can be doing over the summer to support students when they come back in the fall. But we will also share at the end of today's session a sample planning tool that you can use that walks you through these, these three phases in preparation for fall reentry. So to get started with our content for today, we're going to look at two schools. First, Cowan Elementary, a pre-K through eight school. 
and then Greenbrier Elementary School, also a pre-K through eight school. Each of these schools has taken a different approach to fall re-entry, and we're gonna look at how that impacts students in their school through examining Tanya's case study, a sixth grader entering in the fall, and Damien at Greenbrier, a fourth grader entering in the fall. To access Tanya and Damien's stories, go ahead and follow the tiny URL link that you see here on the screen. One of our colleagues has also just dropped this into the chat box for you if you'd like to click on that to open it in a web browser. Take the next three minutes to read the two scenarios for Tanya and Damien and reflect on these two questions. What do you notice and what do you wonder about how each school's approach will impact the students in their experience with math? Go ahead and take three minutes to do that. I'll give you a notice when we have about 30 seconds remaining. Take about 30 seconds to finish up. Make sure that you've spent some time reflecting on these questions. All right, let's come back together. Let's start by first focusing on Tanya's experience at Cowan Elementary. Take a moment to write your noticings and wonderings into the chat box. I'll try to read a few of them as they're coming through. So it looks like Cherie is sharing that the first school attempted to fill the gap by layering in that missed information, just putting it all up front. Mary Jo and Lenny both said they started off with map testing. Holly says, it's like she's retaking fifth grade instead of being a sixth grader. Patty mentions, and Lisa as well, both schools assessed to find where students were at. 
Diane mentions they tried to go back and finish fifth grade. Barbara mentions that there is out of context teaching. The intervention is approaching missing skills. And Cindy mentions Tanya was taught tips and tricks rather than conceptual understanding. All right, go ahead and keep those ideas coming through. We'll keep looking at them as they come in. Um, but as many of you mentioned, we also saw that this was a misaligned approach from Cowan Elementary for Tanya and her classmates. It focused on remediation, not integration. First, as was mentioned, procedural tips and tricks were used to speed up instruction. What that ultimately leads to, however, is an illusion of mastery and shallow conceptual understanding, which isn't going to be a great foundation to build upon. The intervention was based on weakest domains for students, and the reliance on the blended learning program in what they were teaching wasn't aligned with the units of study of what was happening during the main math block. Also, as many of you mentioned, that condensed fifth grade content just focuses on an inch deep of information as quickly as possible, leaving learning unfinished by the end of sixth grade. Ultimately, what this is going to lead to for Tanya and her classmates is widened unfinished learning at the end of their sixth grade year, moving toward seventh grade. Let's now take a moment to debrief on Damien's experience at Greenbrier Elementary. Again, drop into the chat box and I see some of you have already started. What do you notice and wonder about how this school's approach will impact Damien and his classmates with their experience in math? So Lenny mentions extra time is provided to catch up. Chelsea says they continued content with intervention around the areas of struggle. Chris points out that they provided social emotional learning to students to build community. Anne mentions they started the year with community building. Julie talks about taking care of the whole student emotionally and academically. Christy says decisions were made using data but layered instruction was intentionally aligned to the need. Allison says, everything is intentional based on what is essential. Lisa mentions that Damien and his classmates get to learning new standards, not last year's content alone. Megan mentions learning continued to move forward. Great ideas, keep them coming through. So as you're all mentioning in there, we do see a more aligned approach here from Greenbrier Elementary School focused on integration. As many of you mentioned, they started off by building positive culture and social emotional skills before diving into the content. This connects back to that first guiding principle of putting people first that we talked about earlier. While we won't spend a ton of time on this in today's webinar, it is an invaluable approach that we wanted to make sure to clearly name. In terms of math content, we also saw that they identified unfinished learning with timely and relevant diagnostics. They planned just-in-time instruction to address unfinished learning connected to the grade level content. Intervention time wasn't just, let's go look at the places you're weakest in, but instead it was connected to address unfinished learning related to the content in their math block. They also prioritized the major work and planned for unfinished learning around it, ultimately leading to Damien and his classmates being better prepared to access fifth grade content by the end of their fourth grade year. So, we seem to be in agreement that Damien's class is receiving stronger support to address their unfinished learning. The premise behind Damien's story is the presence of the Nebraska Instructional Shifts for Mathematics. The shifts are the big picture for understanding and teaching the standards. 
and through them, we can identify guidance for our roadmap in addressing unfinished learning, both in everyday situations and this unprecedented time we find ourselves in. From the shifts, the Greenbrier team recognized the importance of focusing on the major work of the grade. They spent the bulk of their time addressing major work of fourth grade and the key missed and unfinished learning from major work of third grade aligned to it. It's key to note that they did not ignore the supporting and additional work from the grade, but rather worked to embed this where it was necessary for the coherence of student learning. They did this through spending time tracing the coherence of the standards to identify opportunities to address unfinished learning. A quick side note here, at the end of our webinar, we'll be sharing information about a resource coming out from Student Achievement Partners in the next week or so. That will help provide guidance on the most essential content at each grade. So keep this resource in mind as a tool to support your work. Ultimately, the instructional shifts are essential to this work, and we'll spend the remainder of our session today examining what the Greenbrier teachers did and how we can create that same opportunity for our own teachers. One quick bonus I do want to take a, a moment just to step out and say, I saw a couple comments come through around this as we were um, entering them into the chat box. Damien School looked at how they could best maximize summer to allow for some learning recovery around missed content as a result of the early school building closures. We're going to spend time on Thursday talking about what that can look like and how it can benefit students, but even without that summer learning recovery, we still see that Damien's story is more aligned to supporting students in their learning. Adding that summer learning recovery is an additional step that can bolster students' access to grade level content in the fall. So this leads us to our question that we're going to examine today. How do we address unfinished learning in an equitable and shifts aligned way? When we're talking about shifts aligned again, we're referring back to those Nebraska instructional shifts for math. Take a moment just to look at our agenda for today so you can see how we'll go through the rest of our sessions. And now we're going to jump into the what, some considerations for math unfinished learning. Now we know that learning is never really finished. We consider ourselves often to be lifelong learners. However, when it comes to math instruction, students usually come to us with varying levels of unfinished learning in a normal school year. Just like a batch of muffins is impacted when made with not enough egg or too little baking powder, not enough conceptual understanding of place value, or procedural skill with division can create gaps in student learning that have significant impact on their readiness for grade level content. Before we get to baking though, we want to establish a common understanding of what unfinished learning is in the context of math. Unlike reading, math is conceptually expansive. Once a student has developed phonemic awareness and can put letters together to read words, they've learned a transferable skill that they can use to decode most words in any text. In math, however, just knowing how to put numbers together and take them apart does not necessarily transfer to accessing problems that require proportional reasoning or understanding of measures of central tendency. Connections are at the heart of mathematics, and in order to make connections, students must have the foundational knowledge to connect one part of math to another. Unfinished learning, then, is really an opportunity for us to help students make math connections by filling in the incomplete or missing ingredients needed to master a skill, idea, or foundational standard. Unfinished learning in math can be procedural or conceptual. A student with procedural unfinished learning may understand the math behind a procedure but has yet to develop fluency with that procedure. And by fluency, we mean not only fast and accurate with computation, but also students being able to think about numbers flexibly and select strategies that are efficient. A student with conceptual unfinished learning has not yet developed the prerequisite knowledge needed to access a grade level lesson or task. They may have misconceptions or incomplete understandings of a concept. 
A student with procedural unfinished learning can and should still engage with grade level problems. It's kind of like taking a bike across the Golden Great Bridge versus traveling it in a car. It's not as efficient, but you can do it. A student who has yet to develop fluency with single digit multiplication facts, a third grade fluency standard, may need more support and time to divide multi-digit numbers in grade four, but they're still able to access and progress in their learning trajectory. Engaging in lessons and high quality tasks involving division is an opportunity to develop their fluency with basic facts. Some other strategies we can employ to respond to procedural unfinished learning include number talks, daily fluency activities, math reasoning routines. There are a number of things we can do to support. Conceptual unfinished learning, however, can halt student access to grade level content. It's less like the Golden Gate Bridge and more like a drawbridge. They can't cross to the other side until they have a necessary understanding of the prerequisite skills or concepts. For example, a seventh grade student needs to understand the concept of a ratio to be able to analyze proportional relationships and use them to solve problems. Similarly, before second graders can read or write numbers to a thousand in standard and expanded form, they need to know that a 10 can be thought of as a bundle of 10 ones called a 10. So how can we address conceptual unfinished learning? Well, that's what we're gonna dig into for the remainder of today's session. So how do we translate these considerations about unfinished learning and math into tangible actions as leaders? What does this mean for us? First, we need to be sure that we're supporting teachers in identifying the myths and unfinished learning that exists for students. Then we need to ensure that that unfinished learning is addressed both conceptually and procedurally. Thinking back to Cowan Elementary, we saw a procedural approach that created gaps in learning for Tanya and her classmates and did not build a strong foundation for sixth grade content to be built upon. Then we need to ensure that teachers have sufficient time to plan both vertically and within their grade. We'll spend some time through our next session focused on the four key actions for math integration, talking about what these three things look like in action. So let's dive into that part. Let's take a moment first to pause and reflect on the situation that you find yourself and your school or school system in at this point. Which of these three best describes your situation this spring? Take a moment to read through them. As you read, a poll should appear on your Zoom screen with each of the three options. If you are supporting a school or a school system, please share your anonymous response to this which will let us have an idea of what situations are represented on today's call. If you haven't yet submitted the poll, take about 10 seconds to go ahead and do so, and then we're gonna close it out and share the results back with you. All right, and Anders, can we go ahead and share that poll data back with everyone so they can see it? Perfect, thank you. So the first thing we can notice as we look at this is none of us are alone. There are people at each of these three places. Whether learning continued for you this spring in some form or whether no learning happened at all, the idea of unfinished learning is a universal challenge in math instruction. Our current situation just amplifies it. Similarly, even if your current situation is represented by uh, situation number one here, 
much of the content that we're going to dive into today is still relevant. We know that just because something was taught doesn't mean students mastered it. So we know students have missed learning. Why can't we just move forward to the next grade's content and teach it as is? Well, coherence or the links between content across and within grades are essential for learning. Without them, students see math as a list of disconnected procedures as opposed to a connected body of ideas. As you see here, the standards are designed to intentionally build off and extend previous learning. This graph shows how the progression of standards creates an intentional and gradual staircase that builds toward algebraic understanding. We can actually trace the foundations of algebraic concepts all the way back through the standards to kindergarten and first grade. If a step or link in the progression is missing though, our coherence is thrown off. It's like a phone call or internet connection that keeps cutting out when you're engaged in a conversation. The more you miss, the more your understanding of the whole conversation suffers. Because of this, it's critical that we spend time understanding how and why these pieces fit together to inform our approach to unfinished learning. We also know that a key underpinning in the Nebraska math standards is using coherence to understand and develop student thinking. As you can see in the quote on the right, because of the intentional progressions in the standards, intervention is most effective when it's intentionally connected to current and upcoming grade level content, rather than an isolated checklist of topics to teach. So you're likely thinking, this sounds great, but let's get to it. How do we actually use those progressions to address unfinished learning? Well, we've broken the work down into four key actions for math planning and instruction. And you can see them here, determining missed and unfinished learning, tracing the math, planning to address, and adjusting pacing. For the remainder of this segment, we'll examine these four key actions and look at how Damien's fourth grade teachers at Greenbrier did this work both in summer vertical planning and how these same actions supported their work throughout the school year. While the focus here is on the work of the teachers, at the end of the segment, we'll step out to examine what leader actions led to teachers having the time, space, and resources to do this work. So let's jump in with our first key action. Now, as we mentioned, the Greenbrier team used these actions both in summer planning and during the school year in unit study and preparation. While the process they engaged in throughout actions two through four are relatively similar regardless of the phase, summer identification of missed learning looks a little different than determining unfinished learning in unit study work throughout the year. Because of this, we'll look at both phases in determining missed and unfinished learning starting first with our summer vertical planning. During summer planning, the Greenbrier team utilized a missed learning tracker to predict where the biggest gaps in student learning would be based on what instruction was missed during third grade. Take a minute to orient yourselves here to the missed learning tracker so that you can see what information is contained within it. So during their vertical planning, the third grade teachers shared with the fourth grade team that module five topics D, E, and F from their curriculum were not taught, along with module six and seven. This was entered into the missed learning tracker, along with the major work standards and the number of lessons missed related to those standards. This would be their main content focus for addressing unfinished learning for the fourth grade team. They did add the, sub the supporting and additional uh, standards, as you can see here, to ensure that they could provide support and additional help to students as needed. But their first priority was to ensure the missed major work of the grade was taught. So the team had now determined the missed learning from the spring and we're ready to move to the next action. And I do see a question that just came through about getting access to this template that will be shared in the materials at the end of the session. So do not worry, any of the examples you see here today will share both templates and the examples. So before we jump to the next step, we do want to acknowledge again this second phase, the unit study and preparation work that happens during the school year. 
and that is using diagnostic assessments to continue determining unfinished learning, learning that was taught or students were exposed to, but didn't necessarily master. Following the work done over the summer, the Greenbrier fourth grade team engaged in unit study before each unit of instruction. As part of this, the team administered a diagnostic assessment about two weeks in advance that helped them understand students' current levels of proficiency on key prerequisite standards for the upcoming unit. They used this information during their unit study planning to determine the unfinished learning students still had. Now it's important to note that two weeks in advance timing is really essential. It's not just a giant diagnostic administered at the beginning of the year. It's timely and targeted based on the upcoming unit. So you might be wondering, where did they get access to these diagnostic assessments to serve that purpose? Here are just a few examples of where you might source completed diagnostics, tasks, and questions to use as diagnostic items. But I do wanna name the first place to start would be with your high quality curriculum or high quality instructional materials. Additionally, be on the lookout for new guidance coming from curriculum companies for your high quality curriculum or, uh, or materials to be able to see what they're offering in terms of diagnostic support, because a lot of companies are starting to come out with new resources, given the current situation we're in. So we've looked at how the Greenbrier team during the summer and during unit study determined missed or unfinished learning. Now let's look at how they traced the math. In their unit study of module five, the Greenbrier team started by identifying what students needed to understand and be able to do to demonstrate proficiency in their unit. They reviewed example tasks and assessment items aligned to the standard. The fourth grade level standard and task you see on the screen here is an example of what the Greenbrier team studied. Take just a quick moment to review them. After they had reviewed those, they were ready to trace the math by examining the previous grade level concepts and skills students would need to access fourth grade standards. They started first with their grade level standard and looked back grade by grade to see what related learning in the same category and standard existed. So here you can see we're looking at 4.1.1 on numeric relationships and then stepping back to the standards contained within 3.1.1 on numeric relationships as well. One of the nice things about the Nebraska College and Career Readiness Standards for Math is that they are connected and linked across grades. So you can look back segment by segment as opposed to in other states or um, a lot of places with uh, Common Core Standards where they're not necessarily aligned in that same function. Based on their progression study of the standards and during unit study, they added student work to it. They were able to analyze from the diagnostic assessment where students were and what they needed to focus on. Through that work, they identified the following prerequisite standards students would need most to access grade four, module five content. Now that they had traced the learning and identified where they needed to focus, it was time to think about how do we address this within our upcoming units. The team planned for this by going back to that missed learning tracker and determining where this content could best be taught. Over the summer, they used the connections they had identified in tracing the learning to pair unfinished learning with specific units or modules in their grade four curriculum. Then they examined the unit overview and sequence of lessons to determine where it could best be embedded in the fourth grade content. So here we see that they had identified content from grade three, module five, that could be, or, uh, sorry, grade three, module five, yes, that could be addressed in grade four, module five. Let's take a moment to dive into grade four, module five, so we can see how that decimals and fractions work from grade three connects to grade four, module five content. One quick thing to note as we get started here, their curriculum is aligned to the Common Core State Standards, not the Nebraska College and Career Readiness Standards. However, 
they can use the comparison document from the Nebraska Materials Matter website to quickly adjust those standards to their college and career readiness standards. So looking at the lesson sequence for module five in grade four, we see that topic A and lesson five in particular presents information around fraction equivalence. The team decides they need to embed the third grade equivalence content into topic A in order to ensure students have the prerequisite knowledge they need in topic A and topic B. Take a moment to identify where it might make the most sense for them to embed unfinished learning around comparing fractions. When you have your answer, go ahead and drop it into the chat box. So I'm seeing some answers starting to come in that they're seeing this show up in lessons 12 through 15 in topic C. And as you're pointing out, yeah, what they noticed as they looked is that topic C addresses this concept of fractions comparison. And so that was where they were going to embed that third grade content. Now this is as far as the team went during their summer planning meeting in the planning to address segment. Once they get to the unit preparation time for module five during their school year, they'll revisit this and plan for how to specifically embed that learning within specific lessons and create adjusted and adapted lesson plans. So this brings us to the last of our four key actions, adjusting pacing. Now that they know where to integrate the unfinished learning within the context of their grade level content, they needed to find the instructional time to implement their plan to address unfinished learning in module five. To determine how to adjust pacing, they considered the guidance their leadership team shared with them over the summer. First, they considered how they could make strategic use of the instructional block time. They thought about engaging students with mini lessons during morning math or do now activities, using fluency activities, maximizing intervention block time to teach unfinished learning concepts and skills, and looking for other opportunities to maximize instructional time in their day. Second, they considered how to adjust their scope and sequence while upholding the coherence of the standards. They looked at using flex days, reducing the number of review lessons often included in end of year units, prioritizing the most essential lessons in a unit, and identifying lessons that might be not essential. They also looked for where it might be appropriate to combine certain lessons that build similar concepts and skills. So what does that look like in action? Well, here we can see that first they used seven flex days from the grade four module five pacing guide. They also plan to use the intervention block time to address unfinished learning in small groups based on their diagnostic data and identified a few non-essential lessons within the grade four unit. So now that we've seen an example of the four actions, you might be wondering what does that look like when the missed learning doesn't embed as easily into the grade level unit or requires more than just a few lesson adjustments or additions? Well, let's jump forward a grade and look at how Greenbrier's fifth grade team engaged with the four key actions. So over the summer, they met just like the fourth grade team. They identified their missed learning from the spring and studied the progressions of the major work of the grade. Through this, they recognized that some of the missed major work from fourth grade is prerequisite knowledge for module one in grade five from their curriculum. They knew they would need to develop student understanding of decimals before starting the grade five module one place value and decimal fractions unit. So to address that and build the conceptual understanding of decimals, they identified the essential lessons from grade four module six, which were not taught due to school closure. 
They also decided that these lessons would be embedded at the start of the fifth grade year as a mini on-ramp unit for students to fully access the fifth grade content. As we look at their adjusted pacing, we can see that they used the guidance from their leadership team. They added additional days to the module by using flex days and reducing topics E and F, which are a review from the end of the year that focus on revisiting concepts already taught throughout this school year. By following the four key actions, the Greenbrier teachers, both in fourth and fifth grade, we're able to not only prepare over the summer for missed learning, but also responding to what their just-in-time data was showing around ad additional unfinished learning throughout the year. To close out this segment on addressing unfinished learning, let's examine two key ideas to keep in mind as we prepare for the upcoming school year. First, when considering any approach to respond to unfinished learning in math, ensure that the response is rooted in the coherence of the standards. Addressing unfinished learning is about supporting students in making math connections by strengthening links and adding in missing links to build conceptual and procedural understanding. Second, ensure that teachers have access and time and support for planning, both during the summer and throughout the school year with unit study and lesson preparation. So, what does this mean for you in your role? Take a moment to reflect and chat for, uh, add into the chat box what this might mean for us as leaders. What are some things we can do to support our teachers and our staff with this work in terms of planning for fall reentry? As you have your ideas, feel free to drop them into the chat box and I'll share some of them out as they come through. We've already got some ideas coming in. So pre-planning, pacing, and plans. So getting ahead of that before the fall begins. I'm also seeing reorganize typical fall PD to have grade level working and planning time. Absolutely. Adequate time for grade level planning. Special education teachers working even closer with their teams to support this work. Absolutely. Providing time during the summer and the fall for teachers to identify missed standards. Yeah, time is coming through in a lot of these. Collaboration is coming through. The importance of teams working together, both within grade levels and across grade levels. And there are some questions as well of how much planning am I providing versus how much is the district level providing? What does that look like? So definitely some things to think about around that and to engage with those in your district about. Yep, speaking with the grades below and above to make sure that you can hear what was missed in the spring and you can share what was missed with the grade above you. Lots of great ideas coming through. Feel free to keep sending them in. So here are a couple of the ideas that really stood out to us as we looked through this. First, and I know I've said this a few times, but we cannot say it enough, stay the course with implementing your high quality curriculum and high quality instructional materials. They have the most aligned content to the standards that is going to support what you do. Schedule time for summer planning and vertical teams. Use this time so that we can be prepared for fall reentry. If we wait until students are back to start doing this work, we're going to be behind the game. Training PLC or common planning time leads can really support them in knowing how to address unfinished learning so they can guide their teams through this work. Also, spend time determining the diagnostic tools and resources that you can use within your school throughout the school year. Again, look at that high quality instructional materials first to see what they have or what guidance they're providing as we move uh, closer to summertime. Also, make sure that you're providing time for teams to trace the progressions and to review prior grade level content materials. This needs to be a key part of the unit planning process. And lastly, ensure that there is time for diagnostics and unit planning to occur in the two to three weeks before instruction begins on the unit. I see some more ideas have been coming through. Keep sharing them. Uh, there are lots of things that we can be doing 
we want to make sure that we keep it simple, right? Go back to that third guiding principle that we talked about. So we've named a number of things that you can be doing. And I mentioned that we have this sample action planning uh, process that we would look at in the action planning tool and template, which is going to be available for you in the materials. This shows some of the work for phase two, the planning portion, that the Greenbrier Elementary leadership team built in terms of preparing their students and their teachers for fall work. This is only one of the pages of the planning portion. In the materials that are shared in the Launch Nebraska website, you'll be able to see the full sample plan from their phase two planning portion, as well as the template for all three sections of this uh, action planning process. So now that we've had a chance to look at what this looks like in action and talk about those four key actions, we're gonna talk about a few common pitfalls that come up often when we do this work and our recommendations for how to address that. First, pitfall number one is to halt instruction for a broad review or to expect that teachers are going to teach all of the content that was missed and the grade level content this next year. Instead, we recommend using formative data and identifying essential lessons focused on major work to adapt your pacing guides and calendars. Then provide just-in-time support within each unit. Remember that Student Achievement Partners uh, resource is coming out in the next week, and you can use that as a way to help identify those essential lessons. Pitfall number two is pulling resources from several new materials and sources to ensure we can address the unfinished learning. As teachers, that can often be our first place to go. Let me go see what's out there so that I can bring some more things in. Instead, we recommend staying the course with your high quality curriculum or high quality instructional materials. They are already aligned to the standards and we can pull content from prior grades to support unfinished learning. Pitfall number three is trying to address every gap that a student has. Instead, prioritize the most essential prerequisite concepts and skills that are going to be needed for the grade level unit that they are learning. Pitfall number four is relying on a computer program alone to support intervention needs, disconnected from what's happening in class. Instead, use those computer programs and those additional intervention resources to support students with just-in-time instruction at the moment they need it to be able to access content in their, major, uh, in their math block. One other resource that I mentioned we'd talk about a little bit today and we're gonna get into on Thursday is Zern. Zern is a curriculum that is built and designed to support online digital independent learning with targeted feedback right at their point of error, but they don't recommend that you do that alone. It's paired with small group instruction from the teacher and additional support based on where students need that support in their digital work. So use those computer programs, use those resources, but do it in conjunction with teacher feedback and support. Pitfall five is to continue with business as usual in our grade level planning. Instead, we recommend that you create guidance for teachers to support use of the four key actions we talked about today during their unit study planning. These are key things we can be doing in today's situation, as well as just generally in our math planning. And our sixth and final pitfall is assuming that lost instruction in math will be addressed in the core math block alone. Instead, we recommend getting creative with available resources and time. Think about what you can do with your schedule. Use the intervention time. Look for open spots within instructional days. If you have it within your scope of possibility, consider extended days or double blocks for math. That could be a potential place that you look. So, now that we've gone through our learning for today and looked at those common pitfalls and recommendations, I'm going to hand it back over to Corey, who's going to walk us through some next steps and looking ahead. Great. Thanks, Brian. Uh, some uh, great questions and uh, things and information were coming through the chat. So a lot of questions about the resources. So a couple of things that we'll point out that um, might be helpful um, and we'll be sure to link. 
Um, I know that we've uh, introduced the coherence map for mathematics from student achievement partners before, because I think mathematics um, um, much different than ELA in terms of how it builds. I, I appreciate the stair step um, visual earlier, um, because I think that's really important for us to consider. Uh, the Louisiana Department of Education has developed some K-12 remediation guides, um, uh, additional progressions documents from the Institute for Mathematics and Education, and then uh, the Nebraska Instructional Materials Collaborative, where we have our bridge document that goes from uh, the Common Core back to the Nebraska standards. A couple other things that I wanted to preview. So um, I think one of the things that a lot of folks are wrestling with is really trying to determine um, where we think students may have left off in mid-March um, and how can we continue to identify and prioritize essential content, um, not only for mathematics, but also for literacy. So one thing I wanted to mention, and I believe it's gonna be available next week from Student Achievement Partners, is um, some specific guidance around grade level um, essential content for literacy and mathematics. Once that's available, available um, we'll be working to um, do some alignment between that resource as well as our Nebraska uh, state standards, so stay tuned for that. The other thing that I wanted to preview, um, and again, I know everybody wants this right now, but um, continuing to ask for a little patience as we build some more Nebraska-specific academic guidance. Um, so mid to late June, uh, one of the things that we're gonna identify is, is that essential content um, and connection back to the standards, but also thinking about the considerations for assessment, uh, what that means for instructional materials as well as professional learning. So um, knowing that that all is not ready right now, um, what I might suggest is a really continuing to look into your pacing guides um, to determine where um, you were le left off uh, at the end of the school year. Uh, we know that some districts were able to continue through their continuity of learning plan and uh, begin to utilize some of those resources that were shared earlier. So we'll continue to post these resources on Launch Nebraska. I also wanted to um, just go ahead and preview Thursday's webinar where um, we're gonna continue to dig deeper into mathematics. Um, specifically, we wanna highlight uh, a resource um, that is uh, available um, from Zern Math. So Zern has identified grade level specific um, learning progressions for summer. Um, so if you're um, able to and you're still thinking about how and what summer learning might look like, this may be something that you might wanna consider um, digging deeper into um, to see if there is an opportunity to perhaps um, address some unfinished learning um, throughout the summer. Uh, Zern is K-5. Um, I believe they're going to have six available. It is delivered digitally, um, so it doesn't take um, an extra... Uh, I'm thinking about our parents who are at home with uh, children or caregivers. Um, they may uh, need a little bit of a break. So Zern is a very... It, it's not... Uh, uh, it doesn't rely upon uh, heavy um, support um, at home, um, but there are some unique features that we'll be able to highlight um, on Thursday. Uh, we will go ahead and post this uh, archive as well as the slides and links to some of the resources that uh, Brian had shared. Our goal is to get the um, video up before the next webinar, so I got a lot of emails about when things will be posted. Interestingly, Zoom's been pretty busy, so it takes a little time to download a video session from Zoom. So our goal would be to have this information up prior to our start on Thursday. I might ask as we're wrapping up, and I think we'll get into the chat box, the link to um, just a quick feedback survey. So always a room for improvement, um, and we'll continually, continuously uh, evaluate um, this uh, learning uh, series and, and how we can continue to improve it. So with that, once you have an opportunity to take the survey, that's all we have for today. I hope everyone has a great afternoon and look forward to seeing more of you on Thursday.